Where does the temple begin and where does it end? <clears throat> I'm picturing the earth from space, spinning blue-green ball, glittering darkness, bright hot sun star, light and warmth bending around the planet. I don't know what lies beyond what I can see in my mind's eye. Another galaxy? Another universe? Nothing? My mind can't grasp the nothing. I don't know what nothing would be like. I suppose if I were to appear there and witness it, I would ruin it. I would ruin its nothingness by being something in it. I am. Where does the temple begin and where does it end? There is our earth in space. There is the light bending around it, the warmth. Let's draw in closer. There is the cloud sky wisping across the surface. There are the floating glaciers. There's the water swirling over the edges of the land. Closer. There are the mountains and valleys, white peaks, tree lines, forests spreading downward, outward, meeting plains, ocean, desert, desert meeting city. There are Earth's overlapping habitats teeming with life, birds, bats, and insects in the air, mammals and reptiles, and all manner of creatures on land, others tucked into the soil, out of sight. And there in the midst of the teeming life and the swirling waters, the mountains, valleys, forests, and deserts is Albuquerque and Edgewood, Socorro and Carlsbad, and all of the places in which people are listening or will listen to these words. Some will listen in meeting rooms and some in sanctuaries, temples. Where does the temple begin and where does it end? A temple, after all, is simply space set aside for a religious or spiritual focus. This sanctuary is a kind of temple, although we don't usually use that word. It's a place set aside, a kind of temple. We come here to worship, a word that breaks down as worthship, to ascribe worth. But we know that our time in this space would be of no worth if we limited our worship to our time just in these seats. This temple's walls are not its boundaries. Perhaps that's why we don't use the word. Temple sounds very finite. And the new sanctuary that we're building out there, that's bigger, but it isn't the totality of a temple either. It's merely another place, a beautiful place, where we will gather, as we do here, to refocus our gaze. So that when we go out, we'll recognize the sacred around us. We come to refocus our gaze so that when we go out, we can recognize the sacred, at least for a while. And when we get distracted, perhaps we'll remember to return again, reset our eyes, see with our hearts like we mean to. But taking our hearts out of the sanctuary is dangerous. Seeing the world with our hearts is risky because we live in a time of transition. This planet has never been static. One thing we can say about the world and the universe around it, or what we know about it, is that it changes. Our best guess is that the whole universe has been expanding since it started, and that it still is. It's constantly reaching outward, perhaps overcoming nothingness light year by light year. Stars have formed and have been burned out. This planet gave birth to life, maybe in fits and starts. It's possible that life began and then 
didn't make it, and then began again until it finally took hold. And then life, when it caught on, began diversifying and growing and contracting through the experiments that are evolution. Eventually, incredibly, life gave birth to consciousness. We understand so little about that, so very little, almost nothing. It's such a mystery that we could be doing this right now. Our planet has experienced many ages, the Hadean age, when the Earth was hot and unstable. Hadean, from the word Hades. The Paleozoic age, when life bloomed and then dwindled. The Mesozoic, when dinosaurs were numerous. And the Cenozoic, the most recent age. Each of these ages has subcategories, epochs. We are in the Holocene epoch of the Cenozoic age. Like other ages, it's a time of diversity and flux. Unlike other ages, for the first time, one species alone is impacting the whole planet, including the climate. And that species is undermining the planet's ability to support all of its teeming, flying, crawling, walking multiplicity of life. That species, our species, is having such a massive impact that some scientists have suggested we are entering a new age, the Anthropocene age, the age of humankind. We're changing the planet so drastically that perhaps it has moved the planet into a new geological age. It's one of the world's great paradoxes that contemplating the extent of humankind's impact on the planet can make an individual human feel so tiny. You know what I mean? When I hear about an oil spill spreading across the Gulf of Mexico and chemicals and plastic poisoning the oceans and fish, when I hear that glaciers are melting and sea levels are rising, eating up some more of the land, which, as it stands, only covers 30% of the planet, when I hear that 20% of known species will probably be made extinct in the next 25 years, and that runoff from factory farms, dirty storm water from city streets, and aging wastewater treatment plants are polluting the planet's fresh water. If I can even manage to wrap my head around what all of this means, I just feel overwhelmed. Do you know that waste heat given off by cities from car engines and factories and home heating and lighting is changing jet streams that determine weather across the globe? and that there will be more and more superstorms, and that the Earth's poorest people are the ones most likely to suffer and die from these things. I feel like I just want to lay down. <laughs> I just want to revert my eyes, you know, maybe freeze time for a little bit so we can think. We're part of a system in which no one is directly responsible, but everyone is to blame. A system in which consumers will eventually be consumed, but not before we mow through the other cultures and habitats around us first. What are we to do? How much can we do? Will anything we do be worthwhile when the problem is so overwhelming? This problem, it threatens to ruin our future, and especially our grandchildren's future, but how many of us are already afraid of it ruining our present if we look right at it? Aren't we afraid of the demands it makes of us? Don't we all know that recycling and changing to efficient light bulbs is only a tiny start? The moment I begin thinking about these questions, I feel guilty and anxious and nearly hopeless. Don't you? And then there's conflicting information and complicated choices. Paper or plastic? Organic or local? What if I can't afford the best food? And so, what do we actually do? Well, most of us recycle now. And maybe we've cut down on plastic bags and paper bags altogether, and maybe we have a fuel-efficient car, if we're lucky. But then, mainly, we allow ourselves to get distracted. We hunker down in our lives. And if we're lucky, we find some comfort, or at least some respite, by shielding ourselves with more mundane demands on our attention. 
We run errands or go to work. We pay our bills. We pick up our kids and buy shoes. We save up to remodel the bathroom. If you've never thought of errands or bills or work as comforting, I don't blame you. <laughs> Most of us don't until something prevents us from doing it, like unemployment or illness or disability. Then suddenly we're distracted by discomfort. It makes our personal worlds small, all this distraction. And you know what? It's okay. I don't mean that it's the right thing to do, but it's an understandable thing to do. We are wired to retreat from pain. And the plain facts about what humans are doing to the planet is painful. It's painful, and the feelings of it and the roots of it go back for generations. 100 years ago, the poet Rilke, who I quoted in the meditation, was contemplating these same things. He was worried and filled with longing. In one of his many love poems to God, he identifies God with the earth, and he writes, Dear darkening ground, you've endured so patiently the walls we've built. Perhaps you'll give the cities one more hour before you become forest again and water and widening wilderness. In that hour of inconceivable terror, when you take back your name from all things, just give me a little more time. I want to love the things as no one has thought to love them until they're worthy of you and real. A hundred years ago, he wrote that. Rilke had a deep love for life. His line, when you take back your name from all things, is such an interesting one. So often, theologies create constrictions around the sacred. We make it small. We coordinate the sacred off to convenient or manageable parts of the whole. You and I live in the aftermath of theologies that contributed to the harm we humans have done by separating spirit and matter. Theologies that said, God is somewhere else, and your soul is something else, and all that we see in the material world is inferior and maybe even threatening. Theologies that taught that God is not here among us right now, but is coming back, so that destroying this godless world doesn't matter. But some theologians have known better. In the same decades that Rilke was writing his love poems to God, Teilhard de Chardin, who was a Jesuit priest and a paleontologist and a geologist, spoke of the biosphere, the interconnected web of life, as the real body of Christ. The whole biosphere, he said, is the body of Christ. De Chardin was a radical thinker in the Christian church, in the Catholic church. He referred to the Vatican as stroking the whiskers of the tiger. <laughs> However, like many rebels, his writings have gone on to influence many people. What a marvelous take on the Christian story. In fact, I think it aligns just fine with the gospel stories. When you read the gospels in the Bible, it's clear that when Jesus is resurrected, he doesn't retain his old form. He walks through walls in the stories. His closest disciples don't recognize him. Perhaps the Christian story is not a story about a God who gets up and leaves. Maybe it's a story about God demonstrating that God is everywhere. What is death but a re-merging of energy and matter with all things? Then the communion makes so much more sense. Who needs transubstantiation? Of course, bread and wine are God's body. Everything is, and communion draws attention back to that. Or consider the perspective of a philosopher of ecology and Buddhist scholar, Joanna Macy. Tom referred to her in his pulpit editorial. She says, we've been treating the planet as though it were a storehouse and a sewer, taking from it and dumping into it thoughtlessly, when in reality the planet is nothing less than an extension of our bodies. The planet is big and our bodies are small. The planet is an extension of our bodies? 
Consider it in terms of essence. What you and I are made up of is the same essence, the same atoms and energy as sequoias and jellyfish and the Sandia Mountains. We are expressions of being. So the planet is an extension of our bodies, and we are extensions of it. Where does the temple end, and where does it begin? Where do you end, and where do you begin? Just consider for a moment how ancient you are, and how interconnected. Child of the universe, you are an expression of being. And because you are conscious, and you love and long for things, you are an expression of being's love and longing. When you hurt, being hurts with you. And your joy is the world's joy. Your destructiveness, too, is the world's. Part of a cycle of life, death, and rebirth that transcends any one person. In my office, there's a statue of the Hindu deity, Kali. You probably wouldn't notice it unless you got up close to her, but Mother Kali wears a necklace of severed heads. She is the destroyer, the remover of obstacles. Hinduism acknowledges that destruction and terror are also part of creation. They always have been, in the food chain and in death, in volcanoes and droughts, earthquakes, tsunamis, and now humans. We are behaving like a natural disaster. But being did something more than whip up disaster when it birthed humankind. With us, consciousness was also birthed into the world, and love. I don't think it is the will of being, of God, of the universe, that love and consciousness should be impotent or inconsequential. The wild love we feel for the world is also the nature of being. I tell you these things, friends, because when it comes to addressing our planet, what will transform us is not rational argument, but a deep, awe-inspiring, heart-expanding, death transcending sense of ourselves as its children. Joanna Macy says, is it my imagination to think that we have been chosen to live at a time when the stakes are really high? At a time when everything we've ever learned about interconnectedness, about trust, about courage can be put to the test? The earth invites your wild love. Starting from that place, then we know what to do. Starting from the sense that the earth is wild in you and that it makes you love it wildly because love is its nature and it wants to heal itself through you, well then you're not so small anymore. The planet becomes your temple and whatever you do that honors it or helps others to becomes your spiritual practice. Don't worry about the complicated decisions, just do what you know. Let your wild love lead you as well as you can, and adjust as you go. Lent began this Wednesday, the time when many Christians fast or pray or give up some kind of luxury as a form of penitence in preparation for Easter. Following the metaphor of biosphere as body of Christ, I can't think of a better Lenten practice than meditation on being and trying out new ways to honor the planet. Here in this sanctuary this morning, we're starting by sending postcards, Valentine's, to the president, asking him to make climate change a priority. EarthWeb, our environmental group here at the church, has lots of other ideas for you too, and I know you can come up with some with your friends and families, and maybe in the other church groups, maybe you'll agree to try something out together. Zoom back out with me for a moment. This time we'll bring Carl Sagan with us too. Look at that dot, he says. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. 
on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. When the Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov first looked back at Earth from space, he saw a planet that was small, light blue, and so touchingly alone. Our home that must be defended like a holy relic, he said. I believe I never knew what the word round meant until I saw Earth from space. It is beautiful and complete, and all that we need to love it wildly lies within us. The words to our closing hymn are in your order of service. <laughs>